Thank you, worship team. Morning, church. My goodness, it's nice to follow worship like that. Thank you, Jimmy and the guys. My goodness. Praise the Lord. Um, <clears throat> I was in a little village one time to do a seminar on grace and who we are in Christ. And um, it was up in the hills and I was expecting a little ch small church and it was a great big building. And uh, I was surprised how big it was. And apparently it was a Christian village and the church was built to accommodate everybody in the village. And I thought, man, this is good. And meeting time came and had the first meeting. There was only a few rows of people in the front. And I thought, that's odd. So I asked why there was hardly any people there. They said, oh, many people are under a discipline. And I'm sort of going, tilt? That's a new one on me. So I asked him, what does that mean? And he said, Scripture says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So if anyone commits a sin, we give them a discipline. I said, okay, what sort of disciplines? Well, we ban them from church for a while. We ban them from communion for a while. Or we excommunicate them. And I was just, <laughs> just flabbergasted. And during the ensuing conversation, I was trying to convince him that as we heard last week, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, God chastens us with his word. And he does it in love. And 2 Corinthians 5.18 says that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And we're talking away, and I was talking about Galatians 6.1 that says, we're to restore someone who falls, not drive them away. And I got a bit, bit carried away, and I probably forgot that the last part of that verse says, in a spirit of meekness, considering yourselves. But I was just so flabbergasted that the, the very thing that we need when we've sinned, when we've fallen, when we've made mistakes, is to be reminded of the blood of Jesus. Communion's a place of restoration. It's where we remember what Jesus did. It's not just, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, Jesus died for our sins, yep. It's not that. It's, it's to relive it. It's to remind ourselves, to think, to meditate on, ponder what Jesus has done for us and what a difference that's made. I mean, remember how his blood paid it all, how God's anger for sin was poured out on Jesus. He's not angry with us anymore. Remember. Remember how our old sinful past, our old sinful spirit was crucified and buried with Jesus and we raised in newness of life. I mean, man, that's, that's what communion's for. And it's... You go on for ages on communion. But we've been made one with the Father because of the blood of Jesus. Jesus presented his blood in the holiest of holies to make a way back for fellowship with the Father. That's what communion reminds us. It's not a place to, to be thinking about our sins and what we've done. It's a place to remember what Jesus... Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Not in remembrance of your mistakes, not in remembrance of your sins, in remembrance of me. Because our sins are washed away once and for all. Jesus died for the sins of not just the Christians, but the whole world. Sin's been dealt with. That's what we remember with at communion. It's not a time to go, you know, digging around, looking for things that I've better, I better remember. No, it's a time to remember Jesus. It's a time to remember to, to be so aware of what he's done for us. God the Father wants us to be obsessed with Jesus, not consumed with our own selves and our sins that have been dealt with anyhow. They're all washed away by the blood. Jesus doesn't look at our sins. He can't. God doesn't look at our sins. He can't. As I said last time I was speaking, he's forgotten them. He's washed them away. He's cast them as far as the east is from the west. How can he do that and still remember them? Because he's a God of his word. If we've got needs in our lives, if we need, have needs for healing or restoration or anything like that, the blood of Jesus is the reason that we can come into his presence with boldness to receive help in a time of need. Communion's a wonderful place to receive healing because the blood of Jesus reminds us that it's not about us. It's not about how good we are. It's about what Jesus did. It was about how much he loved us, about how much he did for us on the cross. And as we take that, that, that wine, we're reminded 
that we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. We're in Him. There's nothing that stands between us and God. So we can come and receive. As we take that bread, it reminds us of His broken body, broken for our healing. And there's no reason why you can't receive healing. He's not withholding any good thing from us because of that blood, because of the blood of Jesus. Remind yourself this morning. It's not just, oh, yes, Jesus died on the cross. It's not just, oh, yeah, we take these neat little cups and little bits of bread. It's thank you, Jesus, for what he's done. Let's pray. Father, as we come into your presence, or we've been in your presence this morning, we just thank you. Thank you for the love that you showed us in sending Jesus. Thank you, Father, that because of the blood of Jesus, our perfect lamb, our sins are washed away, our sins are forgotten, our sins are dealt with once and for all. Thank you, Father God, that we walk in the light as you're in the light. And as we walk, Jesus' blood continually cleanses us. Thank you, Father, that you're not withholding healing or any other good thing from us because of the blood of Jesus and his broken body that was broken for us. Thank you, Father. Let's take the bread together. Thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus. Lord, for the joy set before him of seeing us born again and set free and in fellowship with the Father. He endured the cross and despised the shame. Lord, he did it for us and we thank you. Let's take the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I'm just going to stay in this atmosphere just quickly before I move on. just felt God saying, if you're in the house today and you have got sickness or illness in your body and you are here, you want healing, I'm just going to ask you to stand up where you are. I'm going to ask the church to get around. I'm going to pray for you. As Ken just said then, when we take communion, we're breaking bread with the living God. We are breaking bread with Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And through Him, all things are possible. So church, if you could get around someone who's standing, please, let's pray for them. Let's lay our hands on them. God is in the house right now. His Spirit is here. And He wants to heal us. He wants to set us free. So, Father, we come to you right now. We come to the cross of Jesus Christ, Father. And we lay down all sickness and all illness at the cross of Jesus Christ, Father. We break that bread today, which was your body, broken for us, Lord God, and the blood that was shed for us. And through that blood, we are healed, Lord. So we pray for every person that is standing right now, Father. You know their need. You know what's required, Father. You are more than enough, Lord, right now in this house. So we just pray sickness to leave their bodies right now. We pray illness to leave, cancer to bow to the name of Jesus Christ right now in this place. And we pray for pain to leave, miraculously leave right now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. We offer it up to you now, Lord. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honour. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, church, for standing with us as we did that. Not a lot to share this morning. Just uh, very quickly, our midweek connect is happening at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 6th of October. So if you can get here, come along. Another great opportunity to get into the house of God and to let His Word fill you. Uh, to pray, A lot of prayer, scripture, 
and just time together with your church family. So please, if you're available, come along and join in with us. Um, just quickly, Julie is in the house. There she is. Julie's going to come up and just share with us quickly. Good morning, beautiful church family. Um, I'm just following up really from our conversation a couple of weeks ago um, in, in this wonderful time of worship. And I guess one of the ways we worship is how we serve the Lord. Uh, we have some opportunities for people to connect um, with different things going on. If you are here on a Sunday, which all of you are, um, we really would like help with the coffee cart. Sue has a wonderful team going there, and if you have any training as a barista, um, if you can deal with money or take orders, or if you could even be what she calls a runner, but you can walk coffee out to people, that would be a wonderful blessing. If you're available during the week, we have a lovely connection with a school, a, a local state school, and amongst other things that Denise does there is the Kids Hope Mentoring Program. What we need are people who can commit to one hour a week where you would be given a child, usually a vulnerable child, uh, that you can build connection with and spend time with them. It's not um, an intimidating thing to be part of. They will train you and you get to be part of that community. You're actually going out being the hands and feet of Jesus in that school. And it's a lovely partnership and opportunity that the Christian church has in mentoring these young people. And another thing that we've got happening uh, that you may or may know, not know about is Martha's Cupboard. Uh, it's been going, I gather, for quite a long time. And it's just kind of being revamped a little bit. Jenny is doing that, overseeing it. I've put out um, at the information desk some of the things that would be helpful. For example, we did have seven tins of beans in the cupboard, which have never been um, taken. So if you've got something that's sat in your cupboard for 10 weeks and you haven't used it, don't bring that. Okay, so we just need some of those basic supplies that make an easy meal for people. Um, I am reminded of Isaiah where uh, the Lord said, who shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. So all we need are people who are willing if you know Sue or Denise or Jenny, approach them directly. That's wonderful. If you don't, I've put my card out at the information desk and a list of some items uh, that might be helpful. So I just want to encourage us that, you know, if we want to do something for eternity, maybe it's just walking someone's coffee out to them. Maybe it's just sitting with a child in a school for an hour. You know, maybe it's just prayerfully adding a couple of items to your grocery list. Thank you. Bless you. Being Jesus with skin on, that is what we're called to be, yeah, with our community. Not everyone's called to be on stage. Not everyone is as talented as these guys to be up here singing and playing music. But we often see that as, oh, that's the volunteer and that's it. No. No, no, we do far, far more than that here in this church. We are Jesus with skin on. We do commit ourselves to God wholeheartedly with everything that we do, not just here on Sunday morning, but every waking minute of every day. So if you've got a heartbeat and you love God, come and be Jesus with skin on to someone in the community and help out the church and help out your community, yeah? That was awesome. Thanks, Julie. A lot of the stuff that we do here, we need your support. The building doesn't just stand here on its own. The power doesn't come in on its own. The speakers don't play on their own. Yeah, We need your support. So I'm going to talk about giving. There's a number of ways to give this morning. They should be, I'm hoping, behind me on the screen. And I ask that you pray fervently to God and ask him what you give and then give it joyfully and then we will use it joyfully to extend the kingdom of God into our community so people can taste, touch and feel that God is good 
and that God is real. And He can be there for them in every circumstance. So we just pray that you would help us, help our community, help us keep this building going by your giving this morning, please. And I thank you for that. And the preacher scripture, preach scripture for this morning. Um, if you can, if you could stand with me, please. We'll honor the word. Before we welcome Jeriton to the stage, it is Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 11. And it says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Let's welcome Jared to the stage. All right. Well, why don't we uh, give a honor clap to the band as well, to the team. That was fantastic, guys. And we've got these wonderful pillars of light on either side. In the back room, we were saying, I'm sure there's a sermon in that somewhere, pillar of light. We're all the, we're, we are all the fairy lights. Jesus is the pillar, right? <laughs> but you've got to be plugged into the socket. Yeah, no, I don't know. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. All right. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. What an honor it is today uh, to honor the word with you. What an honor it is to honor the word today. You know, this word is a word that sees and gives glory to our Father in heaven. It's a word that testifies of the Son, Jesus Christ, and it is a word that welcomes the immediacy of His Holy Spirit into our lives each and every day. It is a word that gives glory to the one who is worthy of all glory. Amen? Amen. You know, this Bible, it does not speak to a finite God. It does not assert a measurable, incapable, cold, or lifeless God. No, sir. It offers praise to the God of heaven and of earth, the creator of the universe and all its inhabitants. The one whose spirit moved over the dark, chaotic, void waters at the beginning of time and somehow in those conditions created beauty and brought light and gave life in the midst of all that seemed contrary to that very outcome. This word, church, it announces an omnipotent and powerful and glorious God. Yeah. And in this moment, if we ponder and meditate upon this truth, this conviction that God is great and greatly to be praised, we unlock many things in the Spirit. The God spoken of in these holy scriptures is one that I believe in, and it's one that I hope you believe in as well. Not simply because I made a choice to believe in it, but because I have a conviction that it is true. You see, because if something is true, it is true regardless of whether I believe it's true or not. So I say that I believe in this word and the God that it testifies of because of conviction, not because of choice. The conviction that this is true informs my choice. I've been convicted and subsequently convinced that the inerrancy and the infallibility of this word is true. So even in the darkest of times, when everything around you seems like it's crumbling, you may have no impulse, no desire, no incentive, no personal resource emotionally, physically, monetarily, mentally, to get you to that point of belief. But you do have conviction. You do have conviction that at the end of the day, God is still true. 
You know, some of us here today, our prayer is, Lord, your word says that you would never leave me nor forsake me. Lord, you said that you would be my ever-present help in time of need, but God, right now, I can't feel you. Right now, I'm trying to see the bigger picture as you see it, and I want to believe, but I just don't have the strength. God, I'm tired. I'm emotionally depleted. I feel unworthy. I don't have anything except for conviction and, for, and, and faith, that who this word says you are, you actually are. So even though I can't feel the immediacy of your presence, when I open these scriptures, you say that I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your word says that healing is available to me, that pain is just temporary. You say that there is a plan for justice. You say that there is a plan to resolve wickedness and oppression and wrongdoing. You say that you are a powerful God and you are powerful to perform. Church, do we believe? Do we believe because we've chosen to believe or do we believe because if you were to deny this word, you would be lying to yourself? You would be living contrary to the conviction that you hold. Do you believe this word? Because if you do, then you believe in a glorious God. And speaking of this glorious God, of all the things that he has ever done, recorded in scripture, of all the things he's ever done, there is one pinpoint of history, one moment that stands above the rest that shows just how powerful and mighty he truly is. I'm sure most of us would know the account of Exodus, of how God appeared to Moses in the form of a burning bush, a bush that was not consumed. We would know of the plague and the pestilence that was discharged over the empire of Egypt at God's decree. We would know of how God separated the Red Sea to save the Hebrew nation from certain doom. You know, those, the Bible says that those people who walked through the Red Sea walked on dry land. Dry land in the middle of a sea. That's extraordinary. Miraculous. But even that is not the greatest act of God recorded in Scripture. This same God saved three young Hebrew men from inside a fiery furnace that was burning seven times hotter than what it normally did. That's remarkable. But still, not the greatest act. This same God shut the mouth of lions. He empowered men to slay giants. He raised a promised nation, birthed a promised nation from a barren woman. And yet still, that is not the greatest act of God. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1 speaks of the exceeding greatness, the exceeding greatness of God's power, a power which Ephesians goes on to say was wrought in Christ. Wrought meaning to actively display. This power was wrought in Christ when God raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality, power and might and dominion. You know, that phrase in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, exceeding greatness of his power, that phrase is made up of three Greek words, hyperbalo, megathos, and dunamis. Hyperbalo, it means to surpass in throwing over or beyond the mark. Right? So think of an archer. Think of an archer, how they pull back the string on the bow, and they've pulled it back so far and so tight that when they release it, the arrow completely... <laughs> Sails over the mark. That's what hyperbalo means. Megathos can be translated as vast or immeasurable. And dunamis, many of us would know that word, means inherent power, literal power. So not only is Ephesians describing an immeasurable power at work, this power is at work to a transcendent, transcendent super eminent degree. This is the epitome of power. Then the writer, the Apostle Paul, attaches this specific degree of power to what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. So our understanding of the resurrection is this. Through an act of God, Jesus was released from death's grip. He was raised back into his body and then he was exalted far above all demonic, uh, demonic principalities, powers, might, and dominion until he was seated in heavenly places 
at the right hand of the Father. It was a divine demonstration of glorious, sovereign victory. Absolute victory over both the natural and the spiritual, both the material and the immaterial. See, I could go on and on of the great and marvelous things recorded in Scripture of what God has done. But of all the things that God has performed, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that is his greatest masterpiece. It is the unrivaled greatest display of God's power on record. That's why Romans 6.4 says that Christ was raised up from the dead by what? By the glory of the Father. By the glory of the Father. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was a display of God's glory, of his power. But church, whilst resurrection, whilst the resurrection of Jesus Christ is this precious, sacred moment of actual history, we may often struggle to place it or place its significance in our mind's understanding because we really don't have the capacity to fully understand it. But surely that's forgivable. Can we really understand in our finite capabilities what was at play at the point of resurrection? Now, I'm not just talking about raw power of, say, energy or some metaphysical phenomenon. I'm talking about understanding the eternal significance, the eternal significance of what the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually meant. Now, we sing a song called, Oh, Praise the Name, and then in brackets, Anastasis. That's the official title of that song, Oh, Praise the Name, Anastasis. Well, the word Anastasis is the Greek word where we get the name Anastasia, as in our premier. <laughs> but Anastasis actually means resurrection in Greek, which makes sense because the writers of that song set out to write a, a, a song that recounted the crucifixion of Jesus Christ all the way through to his resurrection. And so we sing this song, and some of us sing it with a lot of gusto, right? <laughs> but do we really understand the eternal significance of the thing that we are singing? Or what we hear about in communion messages, or what we hear a little bit more frequently around Easter? What is this resurrection and why should it matter to you? And I suppose as an additional question to narrow our focus today, if the payment of sin, which is the problem in the human narrative, sin is the problem, if the payment of sin was death, why was resurrection necessary? Death was already achieved. So my aim today is to pair knowledge with revelation to bring understanding on the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what this victory over death actually means for you. Yeah. Right now and into the future. So you may be sitting there right now listening to me and you're thinking to yourself, man, this guy is putting a lot of emphasis onto what seems like a relatively small portion of the entire biblical narrative. Is it really that important? Jeriton, you are focusing too heavily on one aspect of the Christian faith. Well, if I'm coming across like that, it's probably because um, I'm doing my job. <laughs> um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is foundational in nature. It's foundational in the nature of the faith that you walk in every single day. You see, in Hebrews chapter 6, there are six specific principles that make up what is termed the doctrine of Christ. There are six of them, and collectively, they create the doctrine of Christ. And they are labeled in Hebrews as foundational. These six things, which we'll look at in a moment, are essential for not just a mature walk, but a perfect walk. Not just a, not just a mature walk, but a perfect walk. Perfection. We are called to perfection which I know is hard to accept because in recent times, the church has decided that marketing mature Christianity is far more attainable and accessible and sellable than perfect Christianity. You can have a mature tree that is imperfect. And the problem with that is that God expects only perfection. Only perfection. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 says that we are to preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's tough to hear, isn't it? 
perfection. Ephesians 5.27 says that God will present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Perfection is the call, church, not just maturity. And I know this is another sermon topic altogether, but let me just make this point because I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Perfection and maturity actually do go hand in hand. Let's not lean so heavily to one side, right? They go hand in hand. Perfection is something that you are, and maturity is what you demonstrate. Maturity is something that you demonstrate from the revelation that you have been made perfect in Christ, right? Christian maturity is sourced from from a place of imputed righteousness. So another way of saying that is perfection is the standard, Perfection is the standard. Let's not take anything away from that. Maturity is understanding that you cannot achieve that standard without the intervention of Christ. But moving on to Hebrews 6, because that's another sermon, right? (laughs) Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Six principles that constitute the doctrine of Christ. It says this, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, right, Kind of an odd phrase, but it makes sense in the context of the, of the chapter. Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. There's the call of perfection. Not laying again, as in you have to lay it at least once. <laughs> okay. Not laying again the foundation of, number one, repentance from dead works. Number two, of faith toward God. Number three, of the doctrine of baptisms. Number four, of the laying on of hands. Mm, laying on of hands. Has the church abandoned one of its foundations during COVID? I'll leave that there. Foundation number five, end of the resurrection of the dead. And foundation number six, end of eternal judgment. The resurrection of the dead, Jesus Christ being the first fruit as the Son of Man of that resurrection, is a crucial foundational principle of what it means to be a Christian. In fact, so much emphasis and importance is placed on the resurrection that the Apostle Paul himself says that if you were to take away the resurrection from the gospel story, if you were to take away resurrection from the gospel equation, as it were, the whole thing crumbles. The whole thing crumbles. In the Apostle Paul's first letter to to the Corinthian church, we read this. It says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you, those in Corinth, that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also vain. How important is the resurrection? But the resurrection is so foundationally important to the Christian system of belief and the Christian way of life that the Apostle Paul says that if you remove this one thread from the tapestry of the gospel, the whole thing unravels. The whole thing is gone. Now, forgive me, but what kind of religion places a self-destruct button within the sacred proof text that underscores the entire religion? What kind of religion prescribes exactly how to dismantle it from the inside? Probably a religion that has, or a belief system that has nothing to hide. It kind of reminds me of the classic Hollywood action film trope where there's a self-destruct button installed in like a spaceship or a building or the villain's lair. lair, And um, there's no obvious reason why that mechanism should be there. It's not needed in the first place and laid down a track, it presents a problem. That's kind of what we read here in 1 Corinthians. Paul Paul admits in this sacred text that if you want to put an end to the Jesus movement, simply prove false this one thing, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is foundational. It's important and it should be the calling card of Christianity. No one has ever replicated or even come close to what was wrought in Christ at the point of resurrection. You know, when considering the three major monotheistic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, there are, th- there are many things that delineate or separate the three. 
However, in my opinion, the top two compelling points of separation are, number one, who Jesus claimed he was. I and my Father are one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by, but by me. And number two, the fact that Jesus rose from the constraints of death and that he predicted that he would. This is what separates Christianity. Who Jesus claimed to be and who he demonstrated himself to be by way of the resurrection is what separates Christianity from Islam or Judaism. This is the compelling separation. And yet a study in Great Britain in 2017 revealed that only 31% of self-professing Christians believe word for word the Bible account of the resurrection story. 31%. The remaining 70% do not believe it or believe an alternate version of the resurrection or just don't know. The resurrection within the church is under attack. It's probably been under attack for a long time. But the very thing that Paul says essentially holds the credibility of the Christian faith is only believed by three out of every 10 Christians. So that tells me that the other 70% either have a vain faith or they just don't understand the faith. So how important is the resurrection? Very important. And I hope we understand that today. So I suppose the logical question at this point in time is, did it actually happen? (laughs) Because I've sort of of built it up, right? (laughs) I've sort of built it up and, you know, I can't can't just uh, walk away from it now. Um, The answer, of course, is yes, it, it did happen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was an actual event of human history. It actually did happen. And given what is recorded in Scripture alone and then supported by extra biblical sources, we can conclude that, number one, Jesus did in fact die, which is important because some people think that Jesus faked his death. And number two, Jesus rose from a state of death to life, resurrection. So allow me to summarize for you a position of defense for these two considerations. Firstly, Jesus' death. In order to be resurrected... You have to be dead, okay? Did Jesus die? Yes, he did. It's a fact. In fact, though, he should have died way before he even got to that cross. Well before his crucifixion, Jesus was whipped by a whip called a flagrum, a Roman whip. It consisted of braided leather with metal pellets and shards of bone woven into the braid of a whip. The resulting cuts were so severe that the skeletal muscles, the underlying veins, the sinews, and sometimes the bowels of the victims were exposed by the end of the allotted number of lashings. This beating was so severe that at times victims would not survive long enough to be crucified. But yet in Jesus' case, he endured because there was joy set before him. He endured. Those who endured the whipping would often go into hypovolemic shock. What that is is a term for low blood volume. In other words, the person would have lost so much blood and they would go into shock. And the results of this would be, number one, the heart would race to pump blood that was not there. The victim would collapse and faint due to low blood pressure. The kidneys would shut down to preserve bodily fluids. The person would experience extreme thirst as as the body desired to replenish the fluids that it lost. All of, these are effect, all of these effects of hypovolemic shock are either explicitly recorded in Scripture or heavily implied in the Gospel accounts. But finally, we get to his death in John 19.33. And it records that when they, being the soldiers on duty, came to Jesus on that cross and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. That's verse 33. Verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came thereout blood and water. Cardiothoracic surgeon Dr. Anthony de Bono, Dr. Bono, uh, explains that in a dead body, the heavier red blood cells sink to the bottom, and a, 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 leaving a much lighter straw-colored fluid above. The separation of these two liquids was a clear confirmation of Christ's death. So Jesus did die. He died and he was buried. But as you know, three days later, he rose from the grave. And there were two primary, primary considerations, or there are two primary considerations that help us establish the veracity of the resurrection claim. Firstly, there are eyewitness accounts of a risen Jesus post-death. 
eyewitness accounts of people who witnessed Jesus post-death. We have already established that Jesus died. We know that is a fact. And if you saw him alive after his death, you can assume that he was, in fact, resurrected. It's not rocket science, right? How do you get from death to life? You resurrect. <laughs> okay? Aside from appearing to his disciples, Jesus also appeared directly to over 500 people in the same instance. 500 people, all in one moment, Jesus appeared to them. 1 Corinthians 15, 6, Paul says that after um, that he, Jesus, was seen of above 500 brethren at once. So either 500 people collectively agreed to deceive the world of a risen Christ, 500 people are all in agreement to deceive the world of a risen Christ or what they collectively witnessed and reported actually happened. What is incredible about these eyewitness accounts is that an encounter with the risen Jesus changed even the most zealous opponents of the Jesus movement, that being Paul himself and to a lesser extent James. What's more is that in ancient Jewish and Roman cultures, women were severely disesteemed. Their testimony was regarded, regarded as inferior. However, in all four Gospels, it is women who hold the testimony of first witnessing an empty tomb. If the gospels, Gospel writers wanted to inject a manufactured believability, they would not have used the eyewitness testimony of women to do so. These embarrassing elements of an account are only included if the publisher had accuracy in mind. And for this reason, the account becomes far more reliable. The second consideration that we have is the fact that the tomb was empty. Listen, again, this is not rocket science. There was a dead person in a tomb. And three days later, that dead person was no longer in the tomb. There is now an empty tomb. Keep in mind that the disciples began to preach about this resurrection in the very same city that it occurred. This means that anyone could have easily walked to the tomb to see that it was empty. It's kind of like me claiming a, like a, an alien spacecraft has landed in Carindale Shopping Center. All that is required to confirm that what I'm saying is true is for you to head on down to Carindale and see for yourself. All you need to do is head down the road and test the claim. So the question arises, why would a gospel spread so rapidly if the, if the evidence that was so readily available to the people of Jerusalem did not hold up? These disciples were preaching resurrection in Jerusalem. The evidence was there. What is interesting about this consideration is that at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, we find that the chief priests heard about this empty tomb. And so they paid the, uh, the guards on duty to say that the disciples stole the body. But did you, pick up, did you pick up the subtle confirmation? The opponents of Jesus, the opponents of Jesus, the chief priests, did not dispute the fact that the tomb was empty. So there are three explanations. Number one, they went to the wrong tomb, <laughs> which we can rule out. Number two, the disciples stole the body. Or number three, Jesus resurrected. Now, speaking of stealing the body, those who would have been the ones to steal said body, later in life they willfully and resolutely endured prolonged torture and even death because they held the testimony that Jesus was risen under supernatural circumstances yeah. and not merely stolen. Yeah. Why would someone experience such suffering and pain for something that they knew to be a lie? Right. Human nature does not work that way. Right. Now, in fairness, in fairness, their resolve to hold onto their account, even unto death, does not actually validate a belief. So as much as it authenticates a believer's sincerity that what they had seen and what they had witnessed was actually true. But just keep in mind the first consideration, that if the body was stolen, who was appearing to 500 people? So there you have two lines of thought as to why the res resurrection of Jesus has been corroborated as an actual historical event for all people to consider. Eyewitness accounts and an empty tomb. 
That is the information that you have, and it's up to you on how you deal with such information. What I suggest to you is that you consider um, Jesus' claim that he would be crucified and that he would rise again on that third day. And also the fact that he made other claims, particularly the exclusivity of salvation. That's a good place to start. But the key takeaway from the resurrection is that Jesus was the firstborn, the first fruit of a new creation that's spoken of in Romans chapter 8. Through his death, he paid our wage for sin, for our sin. And through his resurrection, he became the first to enter into this new Eden, into this new creation, a final reality beyond death for the redeemed in Christ. You see, what Jesus showed us in his resurrection was that there is life after life after death. Let it marinate. There is life after life after death. That being, of course, the resurrection. The concept of the soul, that the soul would continue to exist after physical death was not uncommon at the time. Life after death was not a new idea, but the idea that there would be a resurrection, a life after, life after death, was groundbreaking and groundbreakingly proven through the work wrought in Christ by the Father at the point of resurrection. And so here's the significance of the resurrection. Here it is. This is the significance. After an infinite existence in perfect harmony and love with the other members of the Trinity, the Son is cut off. He is rejected. He is despised. Then he marches towards the cross as this lone crusader of light and of love to forge a passageway to resurrection so that in the darkness and in the hopelessness and in the devastating incapability to solve our own eternal debt, we would have the possibility to rise as a victor in his resurrection and in his grace. That is the significance of the resurrection. So what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that God's mission on this planet was not simply to pay a debt, but rather to reconcile and to restore. To show and to model and to establish a new life that is not bound in a corrupt existence, but one that has been renewed in His glory. This is why Romans 6.4 tells us to walk in newness of life. Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so you should walk in newness of life, Romans 6.4. So to answer the question, why was resurrection necessary if sin was the problem? Well, sin was the problem, and its debt was satisfied through death. So great, you're debt-free. But we cannot forget Christ's own words. John chapter 10, verse 10, he says that I am come, that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly more abundantly, excessive life, that they may have immeasurable life, they may have abundant life. It is the life of the exceeding greatness of his power that we read about in Ephesians. It is resurrection life that he came to give us. In closing, um, when I was pondering and processing the movements of resurrection, just thinking about it, its features and its characteristics, its mechanisms, I've come to an astounding realization. That being that resurrection is an expression of grace. Resurrection is an, an expression of grace. See, it can be very hard to explain and to put language around what grace is and why it works. But I submit to you today that the future resurrection in its current form, to you and to me, it's grace. That abundant life, that future abundant life, is that it comes to us in the form of grace. You see, the most common definition of grace is unmerited favor. Josh, you can put that, um, that little equation there. The most common definition of grace is unmerited favor. That's a pretty accurate definition. We are saved by grace through faith. The application of faith upon this free unmerited gift, this unmerited act of favor from God is salvation. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. But what is favor? What is this unmerited favor? What is the scope of this favor that is undeserved? Well, I believe it is resurrected life. 
but I was going through a personal difficult time managing my own mind. It was the grace of God that pulled me out. I didn't deserve it. I didn't instigate it, but it happened. That is to say that it was an unmerited expression of resurrection life that was afforded to me. Acts chapter 4 verse 33 says that with great power, the apostles gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There is this not yet fully understood link between grace and resurrection that we experience now and in the resurrection life opened through Jesus Christ. There's a link. I don't have all the details, but there's a link between grace and resurrection. And all I can surmise is that grace is birthed in the folds of resurrection and in the power of what God wrought in Christ. That's where grace comes from, what God wrought in Christ. Grace takes on its meaning because there is something better than your current circumstance. You don't need grace for something that is worse. You need grace for something that is better. And grace is imperative to you and to me because it points us to something beyond the constraints and the conclusions of this world. It points us to something beyond the point of death. It points us to resurrection and the one who attained it for us. That is what grace does. Resurrection is a gracious invitation of communion originating from beyond death, within the folds of eternity. His resurrection, Christ's resurrection calls to us, abide with me, abide with me, where there is no more of death's sting, where it's all been nullified, death has been nullified, and the bitterness of tears is no more. His resurrection urges us to live an annunciatory life that proclaims victory over death. How? Well, in the grace that you live in every single day, resurrection emboldens you to revive corruption into, inter- into, into incorruption, to restore honor, dishonor, sorry, into glory, to reinvigorate weakness into strength, and to quicken the natural into the spiritual. You see, what is interesting about the resurrected body of Christ is that though it was a physical body, the resurrected body was a physical body that you could touch and that you could examine, it was a spiritual body. It had non-natural characteristics. It had the ability to be transported large distances in the blink of an eye. It had the ability to phase through objects. But whilst it was a spiritual body, it still interfaced with this world and the people in this world. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And in like manner, the grace which originates from the echoes of a future resurrection is designed for you to access now in this world. That resurrection characteristic of love, of joy, of peace, of patience, of kindness, of goodness, faith, and gentleness, self-control. Those are characteristics of resurrection that are for you to use right now in your world, within your families, in your workplaces, in your marriage, with your kids, within your ambitions and your dreams. Resurrection life, the, the gift of grace that has been made, that has made you perfect in Christ does not absolve you from your duty to be a light in this world, a force for good and a beacon of hope in this world. The grace that we have received is a shadow of resurrection and it is a display of of authority to affirm that God is the author of life and of this universe and that He is sovereign. He is sovereign and supreme and He is preeminent. And though humans may have earthly carnal conclusions, a resurrected Christ has risen to write the epilogue to your conclusion, the epilogue to your life. Hebrews 11.35 says, um, or Hebrews 11.35 speaks to those who have gone before us who have been tortured for the faith because they had hope in a better resurrection. They had hope in a better conclusion. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is that better conclusion. Today, there is a better conclusion for you, for your health, a better conclusion for your relationships, a better conclusion for your mindsets, for your future, a better conclusion for your soul. And it is all possible because of this foundationally important element of the gospel story called resurrection, in which we find proof, efficacy, hope, healing, boldness, and in which we find grace. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for 
your death, that it paid the wages of our sin. And Lord, we thank you for your resurrection, that it paved a way for new life. Lord, I thank you that no longer do we need to dwell in darkness, Lord, but that you have raised us to life by the glory of the Father. Lord, and right now, even in this moment, those, Lord, who wish to come into that eternal life, Lord, if they have not made that decision, Lord, I pray for them, God, right now, Lord, that they would have the boldness to, to take that step, the boldness to say, God, I want that resurrection life. I want atonement for my sin, and I want to walk with you for the days, for the rest of my life, for the days of my life, and even into eternity. Lord, I thank you for them right now in the name of Jesus. There is new life for them. Lord, I thank you for everyone who may be at a point where they need that resurrection life. They need those characteristics of resurrection. They need love in their situation. They need joy. They need kindness. They need self-control. They need a miracle. They need to turn the corruption into incorruption. They need to turn that dishonor into glory. They need to turn weakness into strength. They need to turn natural into supernatural. God, they need a miracle. And so I pray that there is resurrection life that we can walk in and access and share as followers of Christ, even now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Thank you.